federalism as I don't have to tell any of you. It's, it's not just about the fiscal space, right? Uh, as Justice Selmester pointed out in a morning session, for example, the need. How does one common entrance examination work for a country like India? Tamil Nadu uh, is fighting back what it feels uh, imposition of Hindi, right? As representatives from the South, what do you think are the areas where the diversity that this country is known for is sought to be trampled upon? So I, I think that question gets to the heart of uh, where uh, I think we should shift gear in this conversation, which is precisely this. The fe federal principle is also about accommodation. Uh, it's about uh, enabling diversity to cohere. Um, and in some senses, at least in the 1950 imagination, the strong center was part of precisely doing this. We've now come a long way from there. In this present moment, how does the centralization that we've all spoken about now sit with this need for accommodation of the coherence of diversity, of the coherence of difference? Well, I, I'm, I'm genuinely worried about this because you're looking at a situation where this precise logic that in a country, a union made up of divergent states at various stages of development, of literacy, of various human development indicators, there must be a sense that there is, if you like, the, the common nationhood that belongs to all of us should be a winning proposition for all of us. But now we are facing, for example, in 2026, just four years away, the lapsing of the 91st Amendment, under which the political authority in this country, that is, seats at Lok Sabha, were allocated on the basis of the 1971 census, even though it was already 25 years out of date when Mr. Vajpayee renewed it, uh, it was brought in again so that we wouldn't needlessly open up a situation in which the states that were performing well would be punished, as it were, for their performance in terms of reduced population by also losing the political power that comes with higher population. So that this became a, a rather sensitive situation. I know in democracy, one person, one vote, and so on, uh, means that as some of our northern states have completely grown out of control in terms of population. They should be entitled to more seats. But the result is going to be a serious disenfranchisement of the southern states. And it's only four years away, and I think it's time we start thinking about it. So far, we've been discussing money, fiscal allocations. Those are real concerns. But what happens in a situation where, um, a particularly with a fairly strong majoritarian party in power at the center, at the union government, which has a Hindi, Hindustan, Hindutva kind of agenda, how do we then see the southern states in a position in which collectively, for example, the south is unable to even prevent a constitutional amendment if tomorrow, after 2026, the political representatives of the northern states have a two-thirds majority? What's to prevent them, for example, declaring Hindi as a national language, uh, which many have tried to do, but have always been, been prevented from. These are also fundamental questions. There's a political dimension to the unitary impulse that I think we will have to confront sooner rather than later because it's just a few years down the road. Uh, there is a larger project, of course, we've got a building coming on stream where there's going to be enough seats for 880 people. Are we going to find our parliament being converted into some equivalent of the Chinese People's Consultative Chamber where... Um, Mr. Xi Jinping comes in and makes his declamations and uh, these 880 or whatever thousand people there ritually applaud their tables and that's about it in terms of meaningful debate. These are, these are questions that I think it's time we start thinking about, particularly in the South, because the Southern states are going to find that one of the rewards for their good economic performance, low levels of fertility of women, empowerment of women, education, and thereby lower population, that one of the rewards for that is going to be a loss of political power in the union. How do we deal with that? Anyone amongst you wants to comment on well, this I think very we, important we, point? We have to collectively start camping, campaigning and actually meeting more often and actually start making a case because I think uh, Shashi is absolutely right. We have, between all six states in the south, right now we have 130 uh, Lok Sabha seats. Uh, but if that is going to be reduced by a large number, then I think the voice from the south which has performed well and for penalizing a performer, literally disincentivizing I mean, a non-performer, 
is a travesty of all… you know, in, in all… all forms. So therefore, I think we have to get our act together, cutting across, uh, you know, the various states. I mean, if I say too much, then I'll be called an anti-national, I'll be accused of being a secessionist and wanting a, a new country in the form of South India, etc. So I don't want to go thus far, but I would… I'd rather say under the larger rubric of India, I think all of us, like Rajinder said, we're all Indians first. We all love our country more than possibly, you know, the, the people who run the country right now. But the fact is, the fact is, yes, back in 1980s, when family planning was a big deal, South performed much, much better than the north of northern part of India. Now, you cannot penalize us, you cannot actually stifle our voice by way of cutting down the seats. I think we have to get together, cutting across political parties. Maybe in the next couple of months, we'll request our Honorable Chief Minister either to take it up in the Southern Region Council or otherwise. And I think this affects all of us. So, the collective voice is something that we, we have… We need to, to reimagine our federalism is now becoming very clearly a visible issue on the horizon. Are there other aspects to this reimagination? Uh, there have been three issues that make their way into the national debate on a fairly regular basis. Um, and I'd like both of you to, to reflect on all three of these. One is, do we need to go back to the union and state lists and reimagine the allocation of uh, roles and responsibilities, both keeping in mind that there is a lot more integration, so things that states used to do now cut across state borders, so how do we manage that, as well as the fact that the union has taken over sets of roles that constitutionally were at the state level. The second question has been around the, the role of uh, the, the institutions, like we talked about a little bit earlier, interstate councils, the absence of a planning commission. And the third issue of reform that comes up repeatedly is representation, not just in the Lok Sabha, but also in the Rajya Sabha, was that, which was in some ways to be a representative of the states and doesn't necessarily play that role anymore. So is there scope as we reimagine federalism to also look at these three aspects of reform that come up or is the national debate barking up the wrong tree? I think whatever we're doing now is not working. Um, there was an article a couple of days ago from uh, Ratan Roy um, talking about getting larger versus getting richer. Uh, I was in Delhi for something and uh, some media house, in the course of a discussion, they asked me, oh, are you very excited that India has become a larger economy than the UK? I said, not particularly. I mean, if you tell me that the average citizen's life has improved, if they have better access to clean drinking water and, you know, a garbage-free street, that excites me. You know, multiplying some number by some other number and arriving at some scale, uh, it doesn't really excite me that much. He went on to analyze it even more deeply, which is the point I want to make here, right? We have this perception that the labor from the poorer northern states comes and finds work and helps our economy. All true. But he made a point which I had not actually contemplated. Uh, I, ever since I became the finance minister, I've been chairing the state-level bankers' committee meetings every three months myself. Uh, credit is such an important component of, uh, you know, the economy in a country like India where you don't have unsecured lending, you don't have deep capital markets, it's a technical thing. No? But every single meeting, one of the things we look at is the credit to deposit ratio. It says how much is the total loan book in Tamil Nadu compared to all the deposits made by the people of Tamil Nadu. It is continuously above one, right? So 1.05, 1.10, 1 1.13, something 1.09 which means effectively that uh, the banks are bringing money from outside Tamil Nadu into Tamil Nadu and lending it into Tamil Nadu, thereby helping accelerate the growth of Tamil Nadu, clearly. I had not contemplated the reverse and Ratin's article points out that the credit to deposit ratio in Uttar Pradesh is 0.55, even though it's a much smaller base. 45 paise of every rupee that UP people deposit into the banks is taken out of UP and used somewhere else. That's clearly a retardant to their own uh, growth, right? Now, no, nobody sets this diktat, right? The, the bankers go where the credit is good. That's true if you look at, uh, you know, World Bank or ADB or uh, KFW or JICA. Southern states get a lot more of these projects and the union tried to do something. It was misguided. They stopped it, thankfully. It's a technical thing. But nobody is that powerful that you can control the economy or the market. 
right? The market has its own momentum, has its own logic, its own rationale. People are, you know, uh, uh, s s sentient beings with their own preferences. So, this is actually a great disservice. Whatever the model we have now, this model is a great disservice to those left behind. We, we should not contemplate all of North India as one block, or all of the Hindi people as one block, or all of the states as one block. Just because they happen to vote for a particular party doesn't make them that different than us, right? I mean, it's, it's a different… I think we need to separate the person, the party, the outcome in the election, and the actual lives and realities of the people. And if we look at it from the lives and realities of the people, we don't actually have that much conflict. We all want the same thing. We all want everybody to progress, everybody to participate. We can't say we're for social justice in our state, but then we want only our citizens to progress and not the people of UP or Bihar. We want everybody to progress. This political dialogue around one strong man, one all-knowing, all-person being is obscuring these things. We need to separate these issues and, you know, this is five or ten or fifteen years is a blink of an eye in the evolution of mankind. So, at the core, if we go back to the real values, that is that we want everybody to do well, to have a stake, to do this, then we have to reimagine all these lists. And that's for all states, not just for our state. All states should have greater freedom. All states should be incentivized with the right kinds of uh, variables to deliver the right outcomes. So I definitely think I, I'm, I'm not that um, visionary or that experienced to know what the fix exactly is, but I'm 100% sure that what we have now is not working and we have to do something about it. Your thoughts on the fix? Yeah, as uh, Mr. KTR said, when it comes to the relevance and existence of various states in this country, in the parliament, that is non-negotiable. There is no way that anybody is going to uh, negotiate or give in. Fundamentally, the various states in this country have been formed on the basis of linguistic, on linguistic basis. Now, there is no way that Kerala or Andhra or Tamil Nadu or Karnataka or Orissa or Bengal or Maharashtra or Gujarat, nobody will compromise their position when it comes to number of seats or the actual political presence. That is one thing. So that I think when uh, the appropriate moment comes, it is quite natural that everybody will come together and not let anything happen where their existence itself uh, will be in question. I think we've covered a, a very important set of issues that get to the heart of what federalism is. Federalism as a principle of accommodation, of holding together our diversity and representing our diversity, of being a, of a, a principle which is about deliberation that helps us get through these very difficult challenges of a lot of divergence amongst us as states and a lot for us to learn from as states. And the only way out of that is through a lot more deliberation, a lot more dialogue, emerging from which perhaps some of the reforms or the answers for this new imagination of federalism would come because ultimately we are all coming together, as Shashi, you said, uh, we are a common nation working towards a common proposition, a common purpose. Uh, we can open it up, I think, now for a few questions from the House. So, good evening, dignitaries. Uh, pleasure listening to all of you. I'm Anuradha Tota, and good evening, especially to KTR Garu. Um, uh, uh, the question is about national education policy. I represent uh, Black Buck Engineers, which is into edtech, but I'm very concerned about uh, making the content um, same across the country because each place is different, each state has a different orientation. Somebody wants manufacturing, somebody wants management, somebody wants IT. So it is different across, you know, this um, same content, you know, they have included something uh, related to localization, but it's just, you can teach the same content in, in local language. Language is only one part, the content also is different. So there is very little debate across uh, related to NEP. And whenever I go to NEP discussions, it's all praises. But I feel actually concerned about it. So uh, request KTR Garu to talk about this. <laughs> well, I, I completely, completely agree with you because like it was pointed out, I think we need to start aligning our priorities with the, with the, kind, of, with the kind of prevailing conditions that we have in our respective states. For instance, you know, we just talked about NEET. 
the common entrance examination. And in fact, Honorable uh, Chief Minister of uh, Tamil Nadu wrote to us, he has actually deputed a couple of members of parliament to us and, you know, he had asked us if we sh wish that we should support, uh, you know, uh, their line of thought. But when we actually started digging into statistics, we realized that this, uh, the students from Andhra and Telangana actually have been performing rather well in NEET. In fact, we've been the beneficiaries of NEET. So, the point I'm trying to make is, each of us in our own, in our own states have different challenges with respect to what we want to set as targets uh, in terms of our education curriculum as well. For instance, in the state of Telangana, our strengths are life sciences, information technology, and of course the areas where these two converge, we also have aerospace defense, logistics, textiles, etc., etc. So, when I am designing my curriculum, I would rather have something you know, where I play to my strengths, where I want my children, my local students actually gaining gainful employment in the industry that I'm actually trying to attract, rather than trying to study something which is completely unconnected or, you know, uh, which is, which is uh, completely not known, uh, you know, not relevant rather to us. But of course, you also have to understand, then there are certain courses. For example, you know, some of the students might be wanting to, uh, you know, possibly study space technology. While I might not have a space station in Telangana, I should still be able to offer it. So there are certain subjects, I think, which we have, you know, there's a certain bandwidth that we have to leave out. Barring that, I think the state should again be given the opportunity to tailor-make to literally, you know, uh, uh, create a curriculum which goes very well with their, uh, you know, next couple of decades or next, uh, you, know, uh, 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 you know, agendas as far as industrialization is concerned. Yeah? Hi, I am uh, Sunita and I don't represent any organization. I have just come here as a concerned citizen. And um, <clears throat> first of all, congratulations to the, the organizers for having sort of something like the South first. I mean, it's high time we moved away from Delhi-centric. <laughs> Uh, you know, media. That's one thing. And you could not have found a better panel than this to address this question. That's the thing. That's the thing. And then, uh, just I'm throwing open this very provocative question to any of the panelists here, at the risk of sounding anti-national. Let us all agree that we are a humongous, heterogeneous, unwieldy, and difficult to govern country. Uh, violently yoked together. There's no, I mean, history tells us how we've been brought together. So all this talk of unity in diversity essays which we've written since school, um, are we just romanticizing it? Or do, do you think that it is possible? Now I've listened to arguments back and forth and thoroughly enjoyed it. And I've heard uh, Mr. KTR and Mr. PTR say that, you know, uh, you're talking about decentralization coming in top down. I've heard Mr. Bugana Rajendran already saying that it should be bottom up. Do you think it will be possible, top down or bottom up, somewhere we'll meet and it will be possible to have a proper government, you know, state and central? Well, I, I don't think it's particularly romanticizing the idea of India because honestly, I do believe there's been a civilization impulse towards national unity going back thousands of years. I think that this is a magnificent experiment to bring together the diversities of one space. I used to love tweeting the Europeans by telling them that we had achieved what the European Union can dream for a hundred years of getting to, of different cultures, in a sense, in the Marxist sense, different national groups all converging together into one particular state and sharing a common experience. I think. It's, it's in many, many ways been wonderful. But my argument was that while this, this, this Indian unity is a great precious asset, we need to reimagine the way we've structured it so that, for example, we can decentralize our federalism, ideally right down to the panchayat level and certainly uh, to a great extent to the states, so that, for example, the proportion of resources of the central government is not so overwhelming and so decisive that the uh, political authority of Delhi should not matter so much that as KTR was saying, everybody has to stand in a queue in Delhi to get what is rightfully money they themselves have raised and spent back. There needs to be uh, on fiscal grounds, on political grounds and everything else, a reimagining so that we can keep the unity, but at the same time protect and enable that diversity to also thrive. Right now, the danger is tilting in the balance more and more. I mean, there was a reference in the, in the conversation, perhaps very briefly, to the cesses. The government has essentially started disguising more and more taxes as cesses in order not to have to share any states. So you, you're really seeing a situation where 
the state governments are being gradually disempowered both financially and politically. And we in the South, I do believe, are, are facing a disproportionate burden because a lot of our, the taxes we raise here are going off to the rest of the country. And as Mr. Reddy said, that's a good thing. We do need to help other poorer states to develop. But again, as PTR pointed out, are we doing it the right way because they don't seem to have progressed despite all these resources going to them. So somebody, I think at some point, maybe this should be a job for Niti Aayog in consultation with state governments, to sit down and reimagine how we can do this in a way that lets the states get on with the business of actually developing in their own interests and so on. Some of these issues of common examinations, common everything else, would be, I think, much less troubling if we had a clear distinction in our minds between the things that states do and states need to empower themselves for their own interests and some things that can only be done nationally and for which you do need national criteria, national standards and national resources. This is not impossible, but it needs people to focus on the question now.